controlled by its spinning behavior. And you saw that one picture where, where you had a very thin thread. And I don't have a sequence for you, but what happens is the larva is ready to go to the next stage. It, it attaches these threads to some scaffolding. <coughs> it likes to, in the nature, it would maybe curl a leaf around it. And you'll see the spinning boxes. We, we give it something that allows it to attach threads. It makes a kind of scaffold, which we call the box. <coughs> it's very loose. And then once it's ready to go, it empties its gut, and then it begins making figure eights around itself, so it can close itself in. And my guess is that the motion that it uses in forming that shell around it is genetically controlled somehow. It's a behavioral trait. And, um, and that, will, that will influence the shape of the cocoon. So, so they, there's no, these are peanut, considered peanut shape on the bottom left. That's typical of European strains. These long, I've never seen a long spindle shape like this. <coughs> That's another peanut on the right. Uh, peanuts also characteristic of Japanese strains. <coughs> Ovoid is Chinese strains, etc. Et so it's not. It doesn't have much effect on the. I think on the reeling, on the reelability, on being able to unwind the thread. But it's just interesting. Um, here's some examples of silk from. Mulberry silkworm, and what you're seeing here is really nice commercial grade cocoons up on the left. They're big, they're uniform, they're thick. Um, you're seeing the real thread, and I'll show you a little bit about how it's done. And then you're seeing different kinds of products, raw silk and silk. Silk takes very dyes beautifully. So even though the colors wash out in the processing, they really take, they take, they're known to take dyes beautifully. I don't know much about that. <coughs> Okay. You want you need to stop for questions or just keep wrapping them up? Just keep going. Okay. Um, so I want to talk about domestication because that was really that's a major event and really it's what makes the silk industry possible. Anybody have a, so domestication means to uh, people like me that this insect cannot live on its own in the wild. So if they escape, which they often do, when you're rearing them in mass, and you'll see some pictures of mass rearing. They are not going to find a mulberry tree, like a gypsy moth would find one, that, or like those little loopers that we have, those invasives now, the winter moth in the spring. In, yeah, 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 yeah. They'll, they'll crawl, they'll, they'll, they'll flop, you know, they'll spin a little balloon <coughs> thread as a, as a larva and they'll float away. These guys won't do that. They're pretty passive. They've been selected for that. They're, the one on the left is <coughs> The one on the right is Bombyx mandarina, which is probably its nearest relative. They're still, they, they originated in China, they're still all over, they're still there. They can still interbreed with Bombyx mori, which has been um, an advantage in trying to figure out some of the genetic differences. Mm -hmm. You can make a hybrid and then you can check the inheritance patterns of some of these traits. Um, you can see that the selected mori is often white, but the silkworm color doesn't mean much. But we have many different color patterns, individuals, but the natural one is the native one, the wild one is pretty well camouflaged. Um, the dark, you see the light, I, I pick those moths on the left to be dark color, often they're just kind of a buffy color. Um, the ones on the right are the, nat the native color. The so you're not seeing a good comparison of size. The ones on the right are really a little bit smaller. Someone gave me that picture, but they're smaller, their cocoons are smaller. The cocoons are very rough. They don't make that much silk. Uh, they only grow one generation a year, but we have different strains of silkworms. Some of the ones in the, in the colder climates maybe do one generation a year or two. The ones in the tropics do multiple. They never stop. They never hibernate. This is all due to humans, just like trying to get your, cow, your cattle to produce more, or your cows to produce richer milk, Jersey cows. Humans are selecting for these desirable traits, and they're breeding together the ones that have the desirable traits, and weeding out the traits that they're not interested in. <coughs> so this is sort of the name of domestication. One of the main things, so one thing they can do is they can tolerate crowding very well. Mandarina can't. Mandarina is really hard to rear, actually. It's very twitchy, and it moves around a lot. No, more used to sit still. Mandarina um, males, they fly. They can fly. Bombyx mori looks like it has nice wings, but they can't fly. Their bodies are too big to get them off the ground. They can attract each other and they flutter their wings, but they don't. They can't actually get off the ground. So their body to their body to wing <coughs> um, wing size is way out of proportion. 
one advantage of having such big bodies one is that they, the females produce loads of eggs. And they produce them all overnight. You make them during the day. You separate them. You put them in the dark. The next day, the female has dumped 300 eggs. It's great. More, mandarina takes ages. It walks around. It drops an egg here and there. It's much more, you know, it's much, it's much more um, casual. Right. <laughs> no, I was thinking it's really, it's better for its survival because it's not leaving a whole clutch of eggs for some predator to use up. So there's a huge difference in that. And I should also say, I also wanted to point out to you, it's the only truly domesticated insect. Um, honeybees are semi-domesticated, but they can still be what? They can still live without humans. These guys can't. So it's just part of the story. Okay, life cycle. This is again courtesy of Nod. Um, I'll start at the top. We've got a female. She lays her eggs. She makes, she lays her eggs. There's the mating on the next to the right. She lays the eggs. You're seeing a picture of the little ovipositor at the tip of the abdomen. And right next to that, there's, you can't really see it, but she has a, a gland that extrudes a scent, a pheromone that attracts the males for the mating. That's another thing that's um, very efficient, but that is very effective. So if we put the males and females together, the males immediately start flooding their wings because they detect the pheromone and they try to mate. They're very easy to mate. 